Yeah, there are two books of essays. My, two books, okay. Yeah. My, my very first book, uh, which in Spanish is called Papeles Falsos, and in English is called Sidewalks. Um, and then, yes, this is my second novel, after my first novel, which is uh, Des êtres sans gravité, mm -hmm. published by Actes Actes Sud. Sud. Mm -hmm. And then, after L'Histoire des Médins, there's another book of essay. In, in this case, it's just one single essay um, called Tell Me How It Ends. And it's about uh, current migration crisis involving the arrival of um, hundreds of thousands of uh, unaccompanied child, child migrants to the US. Okay. So it's an essay on migration. Um, so far, that's it. There's there's another novel that I've just finished, but that's oh. that won't be coming until maybe next year. Um, well, that 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 short biography that you Wait. that you are referring to is is part of one of the chapters of of this book. Uh, a chapter that was written entirely by my translator, translator. Mm -hmm. um, into English. Um, she's a, a wonderful woman, Christina Maxini, with whom I have had a long history now of, of co collaboration in translation. Um, and in this book, she started, she started translating early on. Uh, when I was still really just working on the very on the very first um, uh, versions of the chapters, and so from the beginning she was very much part of the process, and she started making um, like a list of uh, of names that appear in the book because there are a lot of names, including mine, and making little biographies to mm. to just sort of order for herself the the, the map of names. Um, and it's, it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant little thing that she did. So we decided to incorporate it as a chapter of the book. Now, what she says about me there is actually true. I don't know where she got it from. Maybe I told her about it. Maybe I wrote it somewhere. Um, and it's it's a short episode uh, that she's referring to where I was in Chiapas in Mexico. Uh, my mother had my mother had had joined the Zapatista. Uh, revolution or upsurgence in 19, 1994 while well, I went away to live in South Africa with my, my father after the Mandela elections um, and I went back many times to visit my mom in Chiapas and and I even went later on when I was older to work with her in Chiapas too and one day we were in San Cristobal de las Casas um, a beautiful beautiful city in Chiapas and I was walking around and I found a book by the writer Sergio Pitol, and I bought it and I read it, and I always assumed that he he was indeed a, a Eastern European writer, and and it turned out years later that I I realized years 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 later that that he wasn't uh, a Eastern European writer but a Mexican writer, who happened to to translate a lot of Eastern European authors into Spanish, and I guess beyond the end the, yeah, the the anecdote. Um, it says, I mean, it says a lot about me, my ignorance at that time, my absolute foreignness from from my own culture. I didn't grow up in Mexico. Mm. I was born there, but I grew up in South Korea and South Africa and India. Um, so I was very much a foreigner to to my birthplace. And I have also in a certain way remained <coughs> relatively foreign in terms of my writing and like the writing tradition to which I belong, which is not not necessarily the Latin American one, although I do I do of course also um, borrow from, from the Latin American tradition. So um, I guess Pitol, who's one of my favorite writers, reads in Spanish as if you were reading a Spanish something translated from Polish into Spanish. And I think that great, the great books, as Proust used to say, are, are all written in a kind of foreign language. Mm. Um, and I've, in a way, always strived in my own writing to, to, never, 
to never make um, compromises that that the, the, to never find the the direct route to saying something, but to always envisage uh, language as a, as a foreigner might sort of trying to look ways around um, around things instead of instead of reaching them in the most obvious and direct way. The, oh yeah, the Chinese cookies. Yeah. yeah, the fortune cookies. Yeah, yeah, it's Chinese. Chinese. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Although my 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 Chinese translator saw those and she was like, <laughs> "This is not right." <laughs> Apparently, there's a there's a mixture of uh, of modern Chinese and, and written. I don't know. She explained, but it's very complicated. So, the Chinese Ch Chinese um, readers will find. That some of those, some of the Chinese quotes are annoyingly mistaken. Yeah, I do. also, yeah. I mean, I, I learned how to read and write in English. As most children do when I'm when I was, I was six years old, and at that time I was living in South Korea, and I was attending a, an American school. So my first journey into graphic forms of representing language was in English, but at the same time I wouldn't say that English is my mother tongue because I learned it when I was five. So. I guess a psychologist or a neurologist wouldn't say that I'm, I'm, mm. I'm, I was, I'm bilingual. Um, but I am a bilingual writer. I don't know if I'm a Mexican writer. I'm a writer who happened to be born in Mexico. I have many deep connections to the Mexican literary tradition, but I acquired those connections later on in my life. I I started reading the the Mexican tradition in my late teens, and I and I didn't I did, didn't even encounter them while in Mexico, but while I was finishing high school in India, there was a group a small group of, of Latin American students from everywhere from Argentina Peru, and together we 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 were in a very good literature class and we were all quite nerdy so we would we would have a like book club sessions outside class where we would read out loud together mm -hmm. and interpret and try to understand and it was really there i was 17 18 years old uh, that i that i really came into close contact with not only the mexican but the latin american uh, lit literary tradition and began um, like savoring it in a different way, and and also then began writing in Spanish. I had never written really in Spanish, and later on, when I was in my early twenties, I decided to write my first book in Spanish, in part because I wanted to write myself into my own language that was my mother tongue, but as I said earlier, not mm -hmm. my not really my the language in which I had ever writ written and read, really. And so I wrote uh, Babeles Falsos. Other than that, um, that first incursion into Spanish, I, and, and, and writing myself into, into my, my, it's a book about Mexico City, so it, it was also a way of writing myself into, into a geographical space and a linguistic space at the same time. Beyond that, I don't know if I'm a Mexican or Latin American writer. I'm, I was born there, but lived everywhere else, and have and read in Italian and in French as much as I read in in other in in Spanish or in English. So, so I guess I mean, like many other writers, I I don't belong to a single branch. I I didn't have 
uh, a concrete plan when I started writing this book. I didn't even know that I was writing a book. And that was a very good thing because I, I had no, no pressure to, to produce a final, a final object, a final story. My only, my only motivation was that there, were, there was a group of, of factory workers that worked in the juice factory in the Humex that at the same time funded the, the acquisition of very expensive um, sort of state-of-the-art contemporary art objects. And I was interested in understanding the relation between the factory and the gallery that exhibits those art objects and the workers' work ultimately funding the acquisition of the works and the the divide or decalage between the workers in the factory and then the artists and the curators and the people in the gallery. And I was interested particularly in understanding how the workers envisaged that that network of relations and gaps and inequalities. So I was basically, I, it was almost like I had one, that one research question and curiosity. And I wanted to use my writing as a tool to allow them to speak about it, to reflect about it, and, and, and sort of answer my question somehow. So from the beginning, there was that collaboration, right? And I, it was set up like a dialogue in the sense that I, had, I, I didn't have a final, I didn't even know what would happen in the story, mm -hmm. otherwise it would have been a kind of monologue, mm -hmm. right? So I basically just wrote little installments that I would send them every week, and then they would read those installments out loud in the factory, a group of 12 workers. And then they would, after reading them out loud, they would often criticize what they had what they had just read, or they would um, suggest um, po possible developments, or ask questions, or simply tell anecdotes of their own lives that, that were kind of sparked. And many times, and that's what I was looking for, they would start talking about how they saw their mm -hmm. relationship as, as factory workers with the gallery space. So I would, all of that was recorded in the sessions, and I would listen to, to that recording every Wednesday night when, they, when the session finished. And then I would, I would start replying by writing another installment. And so that initial collaboration determined the, um, I guess, the nature of the book and the successive layers of, of collaborations that happened later, right? So, it wasn't only that collaboration, but later on, yes, like the collaboration with my translator and how she became a kind of co-writer of the book, writing her own, own chapter. Um, or later on, the fact-checker of the book, um, who, who herself wrote an amazing, weird list of questions about what was fiction and what was not fiction mm. in the book, and which we, in the, in the US with Coffee House, we, we published as a, as a little chapbook. Yeah. as well, uh, that, that circulates, that they only made like a 400 uh, copies, but they, they're also kind of there as a satellite of the book, um, and so on and so forth. With my different translators, I've, I've had a, a very intense collaborate, like collaboration. I know that my Chinese translator, for example, is, is changing one of the chapters, uh, that because I've given her sort of the carte blanche to, to go ahead and, and change. So it's a book that is kind of porous. It's a book mm. that is, it lends itself to sort of many different uh, currents um, and, and hands to sort of take it and do something else. And I like to, it's like a toy somehow. À la fin de ce, de ce passage, vous parlez justement de, de la traduction et du fait que chaque traducteur, d'une certaine manière, produit une nouvelle version 
du, du livre et que ça, ça vous plaît beaucoup et que vous voulez sortir les traducteurs de leur invisibilité. Oui. Et la question que je me suis posée, c'est si pour vous, tout lecteur n'est pas aussi ce traducteur, c'est-à-dire cette personne qui, qui a une version différente du livre en fonction de sa culture, de sa sensibilité, de ce qu'il entend aussi dans toutes les références que vous donnez. Il y a des références qui sont évidentes parce qu'on a lu les livres et donc on les pense évidentes, d'autres mmh. qui sont beaucoup plus mystérieuses. Mmh. Et donc, est-ce que la, la, la traduction, c'est peut-être pas la définition de tout écrivain ou de tout lecteur même Je vais répondre en anglais parce que je, je suis une personne de 5 ans quand je parle français. Je crois. <rire> donc, uh, that's That is precisely very much written into the DNA of this book, that um, the, the way that the, the book changes so entirely from one linguistic community to the other. And the reason that it changes is that the, the book is set out to be a kind of map of names, right? There are a lot of references, as you said. And those references are, are, are acts of, of very uh, self-conscious name dropping, you know, where, where I, I, I literally drop a name into, into the narrative and see what happens, like see, see what splash it makes, right? A heavy name makes a huge splash in a narrative. Uh, a, a name without so many references makes a smaller splash. Mm -hmm. But the point is that The, the size of that splash depends not so much on the object itself or the name itself, but on the linguistic community in which it, in, in which it is read. Mm -hmm. So in, in Spanish, for example, um, most of the names in the book being uh, names of Spanish-speaking writers, not all, but most, the, the narrative is this mess of splashes, right? It's, it's, it's a... A linguistic community such as the Latin American one would identify so many of these names and have very particular references to them that the narrative takes a very peculiar shape, mm. right? Whereas in China, most of the names of those names don't mean anything. They could be anyone. Mm -hmm. um, so th th it's a much more stable kind of um, uh, narrative or... or, or You can think about it again. I've used this metaphor of sort of water and splashing. It's a much more more stable surface mm. of, of water, right? And and that to me is is in itself a very a very sort of self explanatory way of how the process, not only of translation, but but really bottom line, how the value of of objects be they art objects, installations, performance pieces, or, or books, changes according to, to a series of things, of course, context, uh, but very particularly how, how it changes depending on the weight that, that names have, right? The, the amount of references um, that, that a name possesses. Definitely. I mean, thinking of um, thinking of the literary tradition like a kind of tree. You know? There's, I was going to say, I was I was looking at a tree there that, yeah. <laughs> that the camera can't see, you know? but it's very much sort of the the image of of, of a tree branching out um, with a series of of interconnections um, and a genealogy very much in the way that we think of familial ties and fam familiar genealogies but but also um, in the Spanish-speaking tradition there's a lot of solemnity uh, with respect to to tradition and the genealogy mm. right um, there I don't know if it happens so much in the French tradition perhaps we are even more solemn than the French in the Spanish-speaking tradition and 
I, I, I get a little bit tired of the solemnity um, and the book in, in many ways is also a bit of a sardonic mm. or sarcastic response to, to this idea of this very um, solemn idea of tradition. So calling everyone an uncle is, is, is a little bit of a way of, of de-solemnizing uh, th this, this genealogical um, cliché. Right? Justement, euh, le personnage principal, donc Grand Route en français, Highway en, en anglais, euh, s'appelle euh, Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez. Pardon pour mon accent. <rire> non, <that's right. rire> et c'est évidemment un nom en référence à Cervantes et à Sancho Panza, peut-être, je ne sais pas. Je me suis demandé. I had not thought about it non. like that, but it's a great, it's a great, uh, it's a great relation and if it if there was a relation I probably would have made it unconsciously and it, it no doubt that Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez is a very Sancho, Sancho Panza kind of character mm -hmm. like he's in that realm of characters oui, puis c'est un, un, un Picaro qui oui. traverse les espaces, qui va oui. voyager tout autour de l'Europe, etc. Et vous, il vous intéresse au moment où il se pose. Oui. Il est dans son village, il collectionne des objets, il les vend, et il voyage par les mots, par les histoires qu'il raconte. Oui. Et donc pour moi, il y avait cet aspect picaresque, cet aspect aussi du roman dialogique. Ou oh, dialogique, il y aura un vous parlez très très bien français, <rire> puisque à chaque fois il s'arrête, il parle, il rencontre des gens, il parle, et justement le narrateur de son histoire, on l'apprend euh, après, la fin, oui. Oui, il l'a rencontré euh, par hasard, oui. comme dans justement les romans picaresques, les romans excentriques, c'est pour ça que je me pensais que c'était... C'est absolument un roman dans la tradition de ouais. la picaresque, et surtout... Effectivement, ah, sorry, now I'm going to speak Spanish, English. Particularly the, 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 the tradition Cervantina, the tradition of Cervantes, and the, the many stories within the stories, at the end of which we learn that there's, there's, there's a biographer or, or, or so, someone else who's writing the story very much like Cide Hamete. Um, of in, 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 in the story of, of El Quixote, right? So, I mean, yes, in that sense, but also, I I appreciate that you that you that you notice this relation between Sancho Panza and Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez Grand Root. Um, they're both like, I mean, or maybe Sancho, not Sancho Panza, uh, Gustavo Sanchez is is a kind of Sancho without a Quixote, you know, mm. he's a kind of lost, like a completely <laughs> lost Sancho, who, who nevertheless um, has already internalized the, the Quixotic um, desire to, to, to live his life as if it were a, a story, as if it were as if it needed to be worthy of, of, of being told, right? mm. of being turned into, into literature. Et c'est quelqu'un qui se contente jamais de la réalité, qui la transforme, qui l'étend, puisqu'il euh, invente des histoires. Alors lui, il le fait parce que euh, ça ajoute de la valeur aux objets, soit qu'il collectionne, soit qu'il vend. Mm. Mais c'est aussi... Tous ces, tous ces écrivains qui inventent le réel parce que euh, le second narrateur, Jacques de Voragine, il écrit des vies de saints oui, qui oui. sont a priori des vies entre guillemets réelles enfin, oui. de gens qui ont existé mais vous faites référence aussi à Borges à, à, à Foucault et aux vies infâmes oui. c'est-à-dire à des vies imaginaires oui. et euh, en France on a un grand auteur du 19e siècle qui a écrit des vies imaginaires qui s'appelle Marcel Schwab. Oui, oui, j'ai connu. Oui, 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 voilà, et qui lit des, des vies aussi dans des détails. Donc oui. ça peut être la forme d'un crâne, ça peut être un événement tout petit, oui. ça peut être des dents, pourquoi pas. J'ai pas relu pour essayer de voir s'il parlait des dents, mais bon, pourquoi pas. Et oui. est-ce que c'est pas une manière aussi de parler de ce, de ce rapport évidemment du réel et de la fiction, de la manière dont toute fiction ajoute de la valeur au quotidien au plus indifférent et la question 
de départ, ça serait pourquoi les dents à ce moment-là Why the teeth Oui, pourquoi yeah. les dents um, Ok, donc so deux parties. Yeah. Right? So, yes, first of all, primarily, because I was trying to investigate, as I told you at the beginning, the mechanisms by which value is added to, to objects or, or objects that originally might have a, a very low use value are then endowed with, with symbolic value and other forms of added value. Because I was investigating that, I, 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 I reached out to, to sort of thinking or essaying in the, in the, in the very set French sense of the mm. word, of essaying uh, around the subject, sort of turning around it without necessarily going at it directly. And, and one of, those, one of the, those sort of concentric uh, um, roundabouts to think about this subject was precisely the idea of narrative as, as a value in, in endowing mechanism, as, as a way through which this object may acquire a certain value because it is then wrapped in, in fictional tissue. Um, and then white teeth, well, this is, a lot of people ask me if, if this is a memoir, no, <laughs> not, not about my teeth. <laughs> Um, but in a way, it is, and it is a memoir in terms of not my relationship to teeth, but but I would say writers, maybe artists' relationship to to teeth in general, to their own teeth. There's a there's an anecdote that I that I that I really like, which is um, would really depict the relationship between writers and their teeth. Mm. So Proust had really beautiful teeth. Um, but his, his close acquaintance friend, the Comte de Latremont, I guess because he smoked so much opium, I don't know, had really bad teeth, they were all black. So when the Comte de Latremont would, would laugh, he used to cover, cover his, his mouth so as to not show his teeth. And um, Proust, who was who was very much enchanted by, by, by this, this world of the high aristocracy and nobility, um, especially when he was, I guess, younger, he, he, would, he started copying the gesture of, of, of smiling mm -hmm. or, or laughing with, with uh, his hand over his mouth. Although he, he didn't need to, he had, he had good teeth, right? But, but that, that anecdote very much shows sort of the, all the aspirations, the, the, the social class, shame, the vanity, the pretentiousness, the posturing, the imposter, all, all, of, all of those elements that make up um, the very conflictive public persona of, of writers and artists who, who often invent a... Um, a public character for themselves, right? But teeth are some somewhat what 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 reveals the mm -hmm. truth, right? Um, very beautiful white American teeth say so much about a person's mm -hmm. vanity and social uh, stutter as much as uh, crooked teeth mm -hmm. say about our own vices, for example. Et il y a aussi cette espèce de fétichisation you understand the yeah, word absolutely. Yeah. Um, de, ce qu'on garde d'une personne célèbre mm. et il euh, y a aussi ce dont vous parliez tout à l'heure par rapport à ces, à ces écrivains qui deviennent des oncles et mm -hmm. vous parliez d'une forme d'irrespect et de, et de jeu aussi avec ça euh, mettre les dents de Marilyn dans sa bouche c'est la même chose en fait c'est à dire que ces dents c'est aussi le le symbole de, de, de tout ce livre qui est une collection lui aussi, mm -hmm. une collection de choses qui pourraient paraître quotidiennes ou sans importance et qui prennent tout un sens très fort en entrant dans une collection, en entrant dans une histoire et en entrant dans un ensemble en fait. Oui, oui. ça c'est vrai aussi. The, the thing with, um, you can think about, about teeth also as a, 
in sort of metonymic terms yeah. there, you know, as as a as as that sort of part of 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 a, of a bigger whole, which is um, in this case the the story of the writers that that the series of teeth contain. I mean, the whole the whole mechanism uh, of of teeth being auctioned and sold um, in the story serves as a doorway into stories, life stories or small biographies, which themselves lead to, to, to be able to, to sort of to tell other stories. So, so yes, there is, there are kind of doorways, much as the, as the mouth is the doorway <laughs> into our bodies, no? it's a kind of a soil, right, mm -hmm. the threshold um, between our exterior appearance and our, our interiority. Il y a une scène très très forte, alors que je ne vais pas raconter, mais euh, qui est une installation d'art dans laquelle se retrouve justement Highway, euh, qui est une installation de Hugo Rondino, Rondinone, Rondinone oui. avec les clowns. Est-ce que votre livre, vous le concevez aussi comme une installation artistique Parce qu'il y a un élément dont on n'a pas parlé. Euh, dans tout ce qui constitue le livre, la collection qui fait ce livre, c'est à la fin les photographies avec ces mm -hmm. ces citations d'écrivains. Est-ce euh, que pour vous c'est aussi une installation artistique au sens de l'art contemporain Parce que vous parlez dans le dans la postface d'une inversion du geste de Duchamp, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. donc décontextualisé, mais euh, ça va dans l'autre sens, effectivement. C'est pas mettre un, un, oui, un objet dans un musée, c'est l'inverse. Vous sortez les objets du musée. Exactement. Oui. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say though that it's an installation um, or even a performance piece. I don't, I don't think that I, I, I'm very much in, in, entitled to, to. I'm a writer. I'm not a, I'm not an artist. Um, I I was interested in in investigating mechanisms and procedures of the art world and and how they overlap mm. with the literary world and and in exploring that that overlap and taking it further. But I mean, even though the the, the mechanism by which I produce this had a performative quality wouldn't come at it as 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 this is my performance piece. Mm. Vous dites euh, qu'il y a aussi ce ce plaisir de raconter des histoires et d'entendre des histoires et vous dites avoir voulu unir deux manières de dire des histoires, c'est à la fois ces histoires qu'on racontait dans les usines de tabac euh, à Cuba pour que les yeah. les les ouvriers, enfin les ouvrières d'ailleurs, voient le temps passer plus vite. Oui. Et puis il y a ce plaisir aussi de l'écriture et de la lecture en série, celle du roman feuilleton. I mean, ultimately, the only beyond my own concerns, my my thought experiment, my hypothesis, my interest in the notion of value, the only thing that really will remain of a book is 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 its story, right? And the and the value of its storytelling and and how and what what that does to our souls. I mean we, we are animals that are primarily storytellers and listeners, no? And so the book's only real value I think will lie there ultimately. Um, all all the other intentions of the author will disappear. <laughs> Um, and or, or, or in fact, they disappear as soon as as the book is an object circulating in the world, right? Et il y a une question que je me suis posée, c'est mm -hmm. le fait que que ce soit dans l'espèce de map de cartes qui est euh, cette collection de noms de dates à la fin du livre, donc qui est écrite par la traductrice, dites-vous, mais vous étiez d'accord, je suppose. Euh, oui, bien sûr. <rire> tout entre dans la date de naissance et de mort du personnage. Et du coup, tout ce qui est très antérieur, mm -hmm. très avant, mm -hmm. euh, comme Montaigne, mm -hmm. 
on dit 400 ans avant, euh, quelques siècles avant. Oui. Donc tout devient présent. Oui. Et c'est la même chose dans le livre. Oui. Ces auteurs qui deviennent des oncles, tout est là, tout est présent. Est-ce que c'est une manière de dire que la tradition littéraire ou la tradition artistique, de manière plus générale, c'est ce qui nous nourrit, c'est ce qui est présent pour nous, il n'y a, a pas réellement de passé Absolument, oui. oui. oui J'aime bien que tu, que tu dises ça, parce que je, je, la forme euh, dont je pense la tradition, c'est un peu comme, comme euh, cette idée euh, de de l'essai de T.S. Eliot, mm. « Traditional Individual Talent euh, », où Eliot répète que... I have to say this. Yeah, of course. <laughs> Lit literature um, is, is, is a kind of presentness of the past. Yeah. Une présente... Comment on dit ça Le présent français? du passé. Le mm. présent du passé. C'est mm. plus, plus, plus simple en français. We are... When we when we write, we write with the past sort of on top of us, but we also bring the past back into the, back into the present. And it's another way to view it, which is just this very beautiful way in which you said it is is that it's also one one single map in which all these um, disparate objects, names are placed, so mm. that we can read it in a kind of simultaneousness yeah. instead of in in a in a chronological diachronic way Fresan is an incredibly smart writer um, and definitely a reference in, 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 in many ways, and someone whom, whom I've read and, and, and admire. Mm, I don't know that this book does that that exactly. It's not it's not it's not what L'Histoire de Medan is trying to do. It's I mean it 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 has of course similarities in the sense that it that that it, it takes um, perhaps a character or a character in, in these cases and 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 develops a story about, maybe centered around their teeth, that is mm, hyperbolic, yeah. a hyperbolic truth about them, but, um, but not it's not, not, not false. And it plays with, with um, the borders of, of, of the raw material of fiction, which is often life. But, it, um, but I'm, I, I guess I'm, I'm more, more interested than, than anything in in sort of telling the story of people through 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 this a remnant of them, mm. uh, just a, 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 the debris of a, of of a body. I mean, even just in biological terms, no, when t teeth are what um, scientists use to to be able to trace back a lot of, sort of genetic codings, so. So this this book does something similar, but um, just with a different kind of genesis, not, not, a, not genetic coding, but like a kind of storytelling coding. Mm. Il y a cette citation de Voltaire. Alors j'aurais bien posé une question sur Baudrillard et et le nom de cette rue euh, Disneylandia. Oui. Ouais. Mais bon. Euh, tant pis. Mais il y a cette citation de Voltaire sur le limitation qui est une originalité aussi. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. On n'est pas original ou inédit en, en écrivant à partir de rien. Mm -hmm. C'est aussi par la citation, par le jeu, oui, et qui oui. est un jeu qui est sérieux, mais qui est aussi un jeu au sens le plus ludique du terme, oui. amusant. Votre livre, ce n'est pas seulement un roman postmoderne ou voilà, froid, c'est un livre où on rit, mm -hmm. où on, on prend du plaisir à des histoires. Est-ce qu'il y a une invention dans, dans la réutilisation d'un matériau, justement, et les dents sont peut-être aussi un matériau, qui a été travaillé par d'autres Definitely, mm -hmm. yes. Um, I mean, first in terms of what you said about the, 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 the more... Uh, playful nature of the book. It is a very playful book, but 
as as with children that they play very seriously, I, I was very seriously playing. Mm, and in terms of of how that ties into to the art, other part of your commentary in question, um, which is the way that literature moves through imitation and orig originality is always um, a form of imitation. Um, I, I agree with that also, and it, and, and it is precisely what we were discussing just earlier with the presentness of the past and, and, and the idea of literary tradition, right? What would, what would, what we do when we invent is is we simply recompose uh, with the elements that we have um, in us, and those elements come from 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 other people's inventions, right? from other books, from other lives, from other stories, and we recombine them. We recombine them with with the glue of our own imagination. Um, so it's, I mean, we have limited amount of elements, I think, but, but endless, endless ways of recombining them.